Hello and uh, welcome everyone to my talk about PowerShell classes and PowerShell run spaces and how to bring them together. But first of all I want to thank the organizer for having me today and for making this event happen in the first place and yeah now for even transforming it into a virtual conference. Next I want to thank all the sponsors of the event. So first of all Microsoft for yeah, inventing PowerShell and uh, also for sponsoring and supporting this event from year to year with uh, Jeffrey Snover as the lead speaker, as a keynote speaker and it's, it's a great honor every year to uh, hear his thoughts and have him as a keynote speaker. Also System Frontier, Script Runner and PowerShell One for also sponsoring the psconf.eu. Okay, let's take a short look at the agenda. So first we will take a look at the basis of PowerShell classes. So we will go through a few basic functionalities of PowerShell classes and a few more advanced topics. After that we will take a look at PowerShell concurrency, um, the different kinds of concurrency that currently exists in PowerShell and which features of concurrency we will actually use. So a little spoiler ahead, so it's, uh, it will be run spaces and timers. After that we will dive a little bit into cross-platform capabilities in PowerShell. But the good news first, all of the features that we will be using in this talk are cross-platform capable. That means that you can execute all of the examples that we take a look at today at your PowerShell on macOS, Linux and Windows as long as you're using a more current version. Um, some of the examples even have syntax of PowerShell 7 so I recommend to use PowerShell 7 if you want to yeah, follow along with all the examples that we take a look at today. After that we will see how we bring that together. So how can we combine classes with uh, run spaces and provide some kind of functionality that actu actually helps us. So in our case it will be a logging component that does asynchronous logging inside of a PowerShell module or function and it will use PowerShell run spaces as well as PowerShell classes. After that I will be available for questions, so when you see this video it will probably be either on YouTube or on the live stream of the virtual PowerShell conference and I will be here in the chat and I will be available after this session ends and yeah, we'll answer any questions that you may have. So let's start by taking a look at what PowerShell classes are and what we can do with them. Therefore I have created a class called Calculator and the class, this class called Calculator will be used um, to take a look at some basic concepts of PowerShell classes but also take a look at some more advanced topics. The first thing we see is the uh, class keyword. So as soon as we have this class keyword in PowerShell, PowerShell knows that um, everything that comes afterwards is a class until these curly brackets get closed. So we can use the syntax for example in a PowerShell module to abstract some things or uh, just import it as a standalone PowerShell file to make use of this class. So but what is a class? Um, a class is a construct of some more high-level programming languages like uh, C Sharp, C++, Java and so on. So also called classful uh, programming languages. And a class is actually a description of some code, some methods and um, yeah, th some things you can do with an object. And a class normally has to be instantiated to be used. So we have a kind of declarative sometimes but we have kind of description of of an object and all the methods that this object uh, object holds and we can create an instance for ourselves to make use of all these methods and all the objects that are inside of a class. We can also combine classes, inherit properties and so on but we will take a look at that later. So just 
let's just see what we have in this uh, classifier here. So the first thing we see is a variable called operand. This operand is a class property and it is scoped at a class level. So it's a variable at class scope. We will take a look at scoping a little bit more later on, but um, yeah, it basically means that you can access this variable in the whole class. So from methods inside of the class, um, from the constructor and um, also from outside the class after you have created an instance of the class. The next very important um, concept is the constructor. So this is a constructor of the class. So we have a class called calculator and we have a method that has exactly the same name, calculator, and this is called a constructor. A constructor is called when we create an instance of this object, so of this class, and as soon as we create one, all the topics, all the uh, tasks inside of this constructor will be executed to give us a state of the instance that is um, yeah, like the author would like us to use his class actually. So everything we do in our constructor is to take a parameter that is given into the constructor itself. We will just in a moment take a look at how that actually looks and we will assign the parameter to the class variable operand. You might be confused that we have operand two times here, but uh, the important keyword is this. So this relates to the instance of the class that you are working in. When we have a uh, parameter operand, this is just the parameter that um, the class gets when the when an instance is created. So let's let's just take a look at how this looks actually. So it's much more easier to see than to explain. So let's just take the whole class. We will take a look at the other methods here uh, in a few minutes, but let's just take it and press F8 in VS Code to execute it and you see nothing happens because we just have defined a class. But now we can create an instance of this class. So let's see if we have the instance of uh, the class available. So we call it calculator. We can just see what it is. Oh, it's a public um, system object with the name calculator. It's available. So let's just create a new object and, sorry, a new instance and thereby also call the constructor. So what happens if we just call new? on this uh, class without doing anything. So it will throw an exception because we have defined that we need at least one parameter here. So the system tells us it cannot find an overload for new and with the argument count zero. So we will just give it like a parameter called operand and uh, the operand will be five here. So nothing happened again because we have now assigned an instance of our class to our calc variable. So let's see what calc holds. Calc uh, just prints out the description of the um, class itself. So the only thing that the class currently holds is the operand. We can just call get type on our instance of calculator and see which uh, type it is, so we see it's an uh, object of the name uh, with the name calculator, so that's our class, and we can also take a look at the different methods that we have available in our class, so this would be add, divide, is even, multiply and subtract as well as the property, the class property operand, which is a double that has generated getters and setters here. So this is what, um, yeah, instantiating a class basically looks like. So we've seen that we have also some methods available here. So these are called class methods and these are just defined the same way as the constructor uh, constructor is defined, just with another name. So we have defined uh, one class method called add, one class method called subtract, one class method called divide, multiply, and an 
is even one. So I think all of you can uh, imagine what these are for. So we have just created the most simple calculator, yeah, ever. <laughs> okay, so let's let's work with our uh, calculator instance that we have. Let's just try the add method. So I will just add five, and we have just some verbose output here because uh, we have created. Uh, uh, an output with a uh, right host, um, but we have used um, to create us a little bit of like debugging output here. So we just want to know what actually happens and which method is called. So we have called add. So the add method is called the add method again uses the this keyword, which means the operand variable. Um, is taken from the class scope, so because this refers to the instance of the class that, is, that we are currently working with, that means that this does, dot operand is equal to this dot operand plus operand. So this just simply adds the operand of the add function to the initial operand. So what we can see here is that we have a variable add method scope. So we have this class method called add and we have a variable called operand. And every time we use operand without a prefix, it's just the variable inside of this method. So it is a variable that is at the method scope. The interesting last class method here is isEven. And is even has a return value of boolean and doesn't take any parameters. So is even does only check if the current value that our calculator holds is even or not. So we have 10, it is even, and we add uh, 1. Check if it is still even, it is obviously not even. Okay. So these are the basics of classes. So this is our next iteration of uh, the calculator class. The constructor itself didn't change, but we add another um, constructor and the other constructor is also called calculator. And this is a concept called overloading. So when we add the same method with the same name multiple times to a class, then we overload this uh, method. So this means that we have multiple options to choose from or the system chooses for us which um, constructor we actually mean. So we have seen in our debug output here that the system cannot find an overload for new with the argument count of zero. So when we try this again, I will just copy it. And when we try this again, after we have added this instance of our calculator to our scope, we will not getting an error. So this is because we have added an overload for calculator, for the constructor of our calculator that takes zero parameters and we have one that takes one parameter. And that means that we, let's just assign it to the same variable again, that we can create um, an instance without any parameters and we can create an instance with like for example 5 as an initial operand or as an initial starting value. This is another constructor than this one because the system automatically knows that you have provided one um, parameter, multiple parameters and which type of parameters. So you can also have like a calculator with an int and maybe a calculator with a boolean parameter and the system will try to automatically map your parameters to the constructor that fits best. The other very important um, change that we did was to add a new class method called write history. There's an underscore in front of write history and this is just a convention for methods that should only be accessed inside of class. So called private methods or uh, 
Yeah, depending on the programming language that you're in, but it actually has an access scope of inside of the class, so you cannot access this method from outside of the class. We will see that PowerShell behaves a little bit different here in a minute, but um, yeah, first, this is just a convention, so this is just uh, the exactly same definition that, as multiply. Um, the magic happens with the hidden keyword, so the hidden keyword in PowerShell does not actually hide it, but um, yeah, just let's just take a look at it. So we we have our calculator class already instantiated. So what will happen if we execute a get member? So when we execute a get member, we will see exactly the same methods as before. So we will see add subtract divide, multiply, and is even. And we don't see right history in here, right? So does it not exist or is it really hidden from us and can't we access it because we don't have the right scope or the right permissions in, in this class? No, it's because it's really just hidden. So if we execute a get member force, we see right history and also if we just execute it we can access it so we even can do tab completion on it so we can access this method actually so i don't want to construct the uh, entry which has to be put into here but um yeah just for you to know it's not like a security feature or something you actually have access to this method even if you've used uh, the hidden keyword but it's hidden from the user so it's more like a yeah like usability feature so let's move on to our next example here our next example just um, added the underscore to the operand to have the convention of internal methods as well as variables to start with an underscore and this is a class variable. I have also marked it with the uh, hidden keyword to don't be accessible from outside of the class instance. And we have added a little bit of uh, instantiation uh, logic here. So this is not actual error handling, but this um, at least handles some yeah, miscellaneous inputs for the parameter operand. So when you create a new instant, instance here, um, yeah, let's just create a new instance with uh, five. We can actually see that we also received a new uh, calculator class with the operand starting operand of five so what but what we see is we can't access we cannot even tap complete uh, the operand variable anymore so i can manually input it and i will see that the operand variable is five but you see it will not be printed here it will not be printed in the get member commandlet and it will be hidden from tab completion. Let's take a look at our uh, next example here. What we've changed here is to add the hidden keyword to the operand and also add the underscore as a prefix to the operand uh, variable or property because um, we want to use operand as a class property so to only be accessible inside of the class. And we've already seen that the hidden keyword doesn't actually prevent access to it, it just hide access, hides access to it. So, as you can see here, um, yeah, let's just clean our console pretty fast and then let's just add this new one here. So, when we create a new instance of our calculator class, so let's just do a calculator new again with like five. We have this um, new instance of our calculated class in calc and the first thing we see is that there are no, uh, no more properties printed to the console when we just enter calc. So this is because the operand property is actually hidden now. 
we also shouldn't be able to tap it, right? We can tap it and we also can see it with the get member. So we only see our already defined uh, methods here and not our operand value. So like I said, we still can access it because it's just hidden. So if I just type operand it's 5, um, if I type operand is 10, it's actually 10. We can access it and we can also write to it and that's very important to keep in mind when you're working with classes in PowerShell to not rely on the thing for more than really like usability enhancements. The second thing we did was to add some initialization logic to our calculator constructor. So we have just some verification here that our operand is actually a value that can be used inside of our calculator. Therefore we remove the um, prefix to define which type this uh, parameter is. So before there was int here, now we have nothing there so it basically can be anything and we just evaluate with uh, a try parse on double if it's, it's actually a parsable value. So if it can be parsed to a double value and if not it will become zero. This dot operand is equals to then we use the ter ternary operator I just love that it's finally in PowerShell and um, decide if the underscore operand class property should um, yeah should become the value of operand or zero basically. I think we still have to look at the one um, static property thing here. Static property is accessible from uh, all instances basically and does only exist one. We can also access this property globally with our, um, uh, within our class name. Let's see what calculator has here. So we have history and history is empty right now. We see history is just an, uh, just an empty array. But if we start to work with this calculator class, so let's create a calculator with the name uh, calc1. And that's just our calculator with a start value of, um, yeah, let's say, 5. And let's create a calc2 with a start value of 15. So when we start to calculate things, so like add something and add something more and we add 1 and then we also add something to the second calculator. When we now take a look at the history, we see, oh, the history of both calculator instances were collected in this value. So history, like I said, it's accessible from all instances. It only exists once because we, it is a static property. And yeah. We created a little helper function also to avoid code duplication and this helper function also has a underscore prefix so it should only be accessible from inside of our class and the write history is here to create a new history entry actually every time the calculation takes place. First the entry gets created so we have uh, the uh, entry with uh, this dot operand and we have the um, write host output just to have it here at this place so that we actually get an output when we write add for example and the last thing is that we use the calculator accessor so this is not the current instance so you see this is not this so not this dot history, but instead it's calculator history. So the same method we use to access the history is used to modify the history here inside of our class and it's used to append to this empty array. Next we will take a look at the finish 
class here, so our finished calculator class and what we can do with it. So the first thing we also added was to have a history file, so it's called PS Calculator History and it holds all our history globally, just to show you how to write files. Then this is just our initialization uh, validation here and we have an init history function. So you see there's a static property still that is called history and now there's also a history file. So this history file is used to yeah, have a reference to the actual history file on your hard disk. This is an initialization method, a helper method to initialize all stuff um, for the history file itself and for handling the history itself. So let's let's just take a look at init history here. So we just search for it and see, okay, there it is. Void init history. Init history is a uh, method to create our file, so basically to validate that our file exists by creating it, adding a first line to our file and also um, adding the first line to our global history array. All these examples are available on the IT Insights uh, GitHub repository, also linked in the session material. So if you just want to have a little example with no real use case actually, but with some methods and interesting concepts uh, in regards to PowerShell classes, just take a look at it, uh, use it however you want. Um, if you find uh, errors, just uh, create a pull request and fix them, please. <laughs> there are two more topics that I want to talk about in regards to PowerShell classes. The first one is interfaces and the second one is inheritance. So first of all, this is an example. I think it's directly from the Microsoft Docs um, for an uh, interface. So this makes use of the system.icomparable interface and creates a new class with the name mycomparable. Um, this is not uh, very important for us later on, so we will not go deeper into this. And the second thing would be the inheritance in general. So we have an example here. We will take a look at this um, a little bit later um, when exploring ex advanced um, possibilities where we can go forward with our example. So. In this example, we inherit the properties from Microsoft.Azure.Cosmos.Table.Table entity. And the reason for this is that we will later use um, the Microsoft uh, Azure Cosmos Table class uh, to talk to table storage in Microsoft Azure. So this is just an example for uh, um, an entity that I called VM entity because I wanted to store some information about different virtual machines inside of an uh, Azure storage table. So I created the class of type VM entity and it inherits all the properties from table entity, which means that I can use it in a method that expects a table entity object. So let's go forward and look at PowerShell concurrency. So we have multiple types of concurrency available in PowerShell. So basically what does concurrency mean? Concurrency means that we can execute tasks concurrently as the name uh, already suggests. But um, it's important to know that there are many different types of concurrency. So we can execute things in parallel, we can uh, wait for their output, not wait for their output, we can wait for the return, we can um, create a new process, we can do concurrency in our current process. So there are very many different types of concurrency in different programming languages. And how we can make use of concurrency in PowerShell are with the following um, options. So the first one would be um, to use jobs. So to use the as jobs parameter, for example, or create new job with new job, start job, etc. So that would be a possibility. Um, as you may know, in jobs, it's not that handy to handle output. So you need to receive 
a job object to get its output and you cannot really do like event based um, programming logic or uh, create any logic that um, executes a function as soon as the job has returned without you implementing that logic again. So yeah, it's, it's great for um, encapsulated tasks if you want to do some things in parallel, for example, execute the same task with defined um, parameters on a few virtual machines, on a few computers, um, on a few files, whatever, then jobs are really great for that. Um, but if you want to use it inside of your program for event-based or other things, then it's probably not that good of an option. We have start process. It does exactly uh, the same thing as it su suggests. So it starts a new process. Actually, it's uh, just a wrapper for system diagnostics um, process. So yeah, it just starts a new process and uh, wraps a few properties for you. Then we have PowerShell workflows currently still only on PowerShell 5 and in Azure Automation. PowerShell workflows are some domain specific language to define um, workflows inside of PowerShell that can continue on error, have different checkpoints and can also execute things in parallel. So we actually see the next um, commandlet here, so the for each parallel object and you will say no Jan Henrik, you're wrong, it's not PowerShell 7, it's already in PowerShell 5, right? But I include that in PowerShell workflows. The native for each parallel object is new in PowerShell 7 and it can be used completely outside of the workflow construct. And as we don't have workflows available in PowerShell, um, in another PowerShell version than 5 currently, it's a really good option to use basic uh, parallel processing in your PowerShell in PowerShell 7. The next very interesting topic would be timers and object events. So we can create a timer and register an event and as soon as the timer um, triggers, it will trigger the event or the PowerShell function that we have defined. We will use timers in our example um, because it's, it's a pretty good way to do um, things in an interval and uh, checking for actions and for example use it to write log files or to write logs to somewhere else. Of course the last thing and I think also the most complex one to use are uh, run spaces. So run spaces are a basic construct of PowerShell itself so each PowerShell session has a run space and it executes in a run space and um, Run spaces are uh, basically PowerShell threads in a very simple form and we will take a look at that later and see how one, uh, run spaces actually behave, what it means to have a run space, what it means to have things execute in one run space, in two run spaces and uh, how communication between the run spaces works. The last two things are the most important one for us today. So let's start with the timer one. So if we take a look at this example function um, that I wrote, it's called start PL logging. It's just using a timer. So we have a logging timer. The timer is created with new object timer timers.timer. .timer. So it's this one here. And after that, we define an action for the timer. So our action is called logging local. It's this function here. And then we define an interval, it's 1000 milliseconds, so one second. And we register an object event for our timer, pipe it to null, so we don't get the output. What we provide here is the input object, so the logging timer, the event name. So it's elapsed, that means that as soon as this is elapsed, it will trigger the event. Then we have the source identifier parameter here. It's just a name to identify our timer that we create with re register object events. So it, we call it logging timer, so we can relate to it. And then we define the action that should run every time the elapsed uh, event occurs. So our, it's our action. We have defined our action as logging local. So what should happen here is that this should write a log file or append text to a log file as soon 
as, uh, as our time has elapsed, so each time. And this is completely independent of the PowerShell execution flow in general. So it will trigger every 1000 seconds, it will run in, in, a, in, an, uh, in its own thread and it will not block our PowerShell. So we can continue working um, while this timer runs down its 1000 milliseconds uh, again and again and again until we stop it with logging timer stop and then we should dispose it obviously. Okay, so let's switch over to uh, Visual Studio Code again to take a look at our timer example and also to take our first look at PowerShell run spaces. So this is our logging function, start.plogging. We uh, just talked about it, but uh, I just want to go over it again. So start.plogging is mainly responsible for creating our timer object and register the object event for our timer. So the first thing we do is create a new timer object from timers.timer and then defining an action that should be registered with this timer. So logging local and logging local only writes the current second of UTC now into our log file just to see some changes and to see a number that hopefully change every 1000 milliseconds. Maybe we have some offset then uh, it's probably like the same second two times and then it skips one but yeah. So the next thing we define is the interval. So 1000 milliseconds interval is what we use here. So one second and after we have defined all our properties that we need, we register our object event and we write it to null because we don't want to have the return of that. So when we register our object event we need an input object, that's our timer, then we need an event name. Um, which means the event name of the event that the timer triggers on. So this is elapsed in this case, so it's an event of the timer object and as soon as this event um, is reached or is uh, occurs, um, the logging timer will be, uh, the, the logging action will be executed. Then we have a source identifier uh, with the name logging timer. This is just a name that we can uh, used to refer to this object later on and then we have our action that we have defined and as I just mentioned um, The action itself will be triggered every time that the elapsed event occurs. That means every 1000 milliseconds. So let's just uh, make this Two functions known to our shell and Let's define our log file so we just create a new log file here with a get temp path and get random file name, nothing special. And then we will start PL logging. So as you see, we have no uh, output because we uh, have no output here. Nothing is um, written to the console or to the pipeline. So what happened in the background is it started to log into our file. And to make sure that it actually logs into our file, we can just make a get content to our log file and we see, okay, it just logs every second and it looks like it logs actually the current second. So we can check it again to be sure that it actually logs and it logs. So how do we stop it? Um, as we have defined the uh, logging timer in our function and when we use this whole construct in a program or in a module that we write, then we would put all the logic to stop and dispose this object into our function or into our module at least, or our class. And um, yeah, we don't have this available now, so we have to see which event subscriptions are currently active in our PowerShell session that we are running here. And so what's important to this is that the event subscribers are exclusive to this session, so to this process. We have the event subscriber here, so we have a subscription ID and we have a source identifier name. Um, currently we only have one event subscriber, which is our logging timer. So this is why we can just pipe it, uh, pipe the result of get event subscriber to unregister 
event which will just unregister the event. So let's see, there's no more output and yeah, this is basically how logging works. So the next thing we have to dive into are run spaces. So I have created a file with a few different run spaces tests, but first of all I just want to uh, roughly explain the concept of a run space. So what the run space basically does is it provides some yeah it provides some boundaries inside of our current app domain uh, which uh, in .NET is uh, basically the part where our PowerShell um, environment gets loaded into and inside of our run space we execute our commands so um, for example our current shell it is running a run space every PowerShell normally runs in the context of a run space if you're not using PowerShell as a DLL, for example, natively in C Sharp or some um, other constructs like that. But normally, if you have a shell, you have a run space under that, and um, which executes all the PowerShell commands, and which is also responsible for threading, so for the execution of the PowerShell command that you provide. And this is why it's important to us, because a uh, run space is basically the boundary uh, which we will use for multi-threading. So normally a uh, run space is or has one thread available to run tasks so we cannot execute uh, commands in parallel or scripts in parallel inside of a run space. And to show the whole construct and how a run space behave in different uh, situations I have just created a few lines of output here to see and to understand what um, the run space actually does and uh, in which process it runs and which threads it currently uses. So I have a script called thread information script and um, I have just uh, hard coded the uh, thread info file so the temp file where I want to log all this info to and this script will be invoked in different contexts. So we will see that uh, in, a, in a few seconds, but let's just go through this uh, over these few lines. So, like I said, at first we defined our output file where we lock our, um, all our lock messages, then we get our thread ID. We get the thread ID from the current app domain um, with the get from current thread ID method. Then we get the process from the thread uh, from our current process ID, so from the uh, dollar PID variable, and then we will write this out as a log message. So our log message is basically just in square brackets the current time to have a timestamp, then our process name, and um, then in braces just the process ID and the current thread ID. And I've also added some uh, lines for in run space, um, so to know in which run space the current execution happens as long as it's available. So we will see in a minute that the host run space ID field is not um, available in every context, but we can always get the um, run space ID at least from the instant that instantiated or created that run space. So let's just, um, yeah, let's just make this uh, script known to our PowerShell. So execute this and now we have our script available and the first thing we do is to create a run space. So to create a run space we use the uh, run space factory class in PowerShell. So the run space factory is the source for uh, us. I don't want to go very deep onto this but it's basically the um, .NET namespace of the .NET class uh, that helps us manage run spaces, create new run spaces and also later on we see here to create run space pools that will be the more uh, interesting part later on. But just to understand what the run space actually does and what it's capable of, let's just create a new run space here. So just make sure that I'm in the right uh, command line. So and let's see what this run space shows us. So we have a run space, it has the ID 4, it has uh, the computer name because it also could be a remote um, run space and remote session. 
the state is open because we opened it and the availability which is very important in a few seconds is available so it's not anything else it's available and let's see how this behaves with just the single script in our single threaded run space so to understand how um, the things execute that you execute now we will just do a get content onto our thread info txt and do wait so that we can watch for any changes and any um, entries that appear here and let's just hope that there will be no problems with any file handling. So okay the first thing we do is to create a new PowerShell instance um, and to and this PowerShell instance needs a run space where it can execute its code in. So we provide it with our newly created run space, so run space ID 4, and we add a script, which is our threat information script, and then we execute it. I've also added a, a little a lock output so that we know which source um, executed the script. So this is manual because we manually inserted it. It's uh, important for later on if we see how this works in a different context. So let's see, um, let's just execute this so that we have a new instance of PowerShell and it just gives us a little bit of verbose information about our run space or run space pool, it's none in this case. Um, and yeah, obviously the objects, instance ID and so on that we get as a return. So then let's lock something into our uh, file that already works great and our run space id is also the run space id that we have created and now we will get a handle so that we can check the status of our begin invoke um, function on our powershell object so let's just uh, do this powershell.begin invoke and we see using .NET with process id 18, 240 and thread ID 76. So this is very interesting because uh, we know that, um, or at least for me, I uh, ran PowerShell, so PWSH as a .NET global tool. So this is why it shows .NET to me. Um, it could also show like PWSH or uh, the ISE process, for example, or yeah, the process that uh, currently is used to host this run space that PowerShell executes in. So what we've seen here is it has executed our threat information script. So we have this output here. And like I said, the run space is missing here because in the context that it executes, it doesn't have access to the um, run space ID um, um, it doesn't have access to the uh, run space ID with the host object, so with the uh, host variable. And then it slept for five seconds and we added another line so that we are not using this thread anymore. And why this is very important is that this, as long as this uh, starts sleep, so as long as this um, script sleeps, it actually uses the run space, so it blocks it. And so to verify this, we will get a list of our run spaces. So get run space, and we see our four run spaces here. Then let's just get the most important information. So our ID, our name, and our run space availability. And now let's execute this single thread again. So Now this executes and if we are fast enough, we see our run space number four is busy while executing this code that we gave them. And now it's available again. And what that means is as long as this runs, so as long as our run space is busy, um, we cannot execute any other code or any more code. So, and to show this, um, I've just prepared a little uh, loop for a, a sequential execution. So what we do here is just exactly the same as above. We just um, create a new PowerShell instance, tell it that the run space of this PowerShell instance is our run space. Um, so the one that we created up here. 
and we want to add the script and begin invoke. So when we execute this, so if we take a look at our log here, we see that only one line appears. So that is this line. So we only have one process and one thread writing into this run space. We haven't gotten any errors here, but there were errors internally. So the error would um, probably be something like, it's in busy state, you cannot handle any scripts, please try again later, or please wait until it's not busy. So what we can do to execute things sequentially, we can just um, do a little check for run space availability. So we have our run space available here, and we can just check if it's available, and if it's available, we will execute this. And if it's not available, we just wait one second. So let's try it again with this part here. So I have little, I've added a little bit of uh, verbose output for uh, the run space availability. So we see it checks for our run space, number four, and we see for five seconds, that's how long we wait, um, it's busy, and then it's available again. So. So what we see here is that every time it's available again, our uh, code gets executed in a new thread. And as long as, as it's not available, our code just waits for it to be executed. So this is not parallelity, it's not concurrency, it's just um, sequential uh, work and just waiting for it um, to finish. So we don't need this construct to have, um, have a similar behavior. We can also do this in every PowerShell script that we have by just sequentially write command after command. So the interesting part is the run space factory. So what the run space factory does it is that it provides us a run space pool, not just a single run space. Because as we've seen, this run space by default has only one thread available to execute on and then it's busy. Let's create a run space pool. So now, now we have a run space pool and if we take a look at it, the output looks a little bit different than the um, output of our run space. So we have um, a run space pool availability to available, thread options to default and we have a cleanup interval. So let's see how this run space pool behaves. So we have this uh, run space pool opened now and we will do the same thing as before. So we will create a new PowerShell instance, but now instead of um, referencing and defining a run space, we will create or uh, we will reference our run space pool as a property on our PowerShell instance. So let's just do this first. Now we have it assigned to our, uh, our run space pool assigned to our PowerShell instance and we will add our script and we will begin invoke again. So, so let's just execute this line, this four lines here, which do exactly the same, same thing as we just explained, just uh, with the run space pool instead of a run space. Okay, what we see now is that it uses the same thread actually all the time, so we don't get a new thread ID, it's always thread 31 and we should see our two debug outputs. So it started using um, the run space in thread 31 and it ended in 31. So we have thread 31 as part of our run space pool. So, so this is probably the thread that is uh, hosting one of the run spaces available in the run space. And very interesting thing that we can do with our run space pool is get the available run space. We have five run spaces available by default when we create a run space pool with this properties. Um, we defined that we want to have five run spaces available and as soon as we start invoking, so let's execute this again and execute the get available run space, we have four. And what happens if we now do another execution in parallel? Let's go down to our script again. So we have the same 1 to 5 loop here and the same parts as above, but this time with the run space pool. And 
you see we don't have to check for availability this time because we have uh, available run spaces. This is only because we have defined a loop of five and we have five run spaces available in our run space pool. Let's see what happens now. What we see is all these five run spaces started working in parallel. So we have thread 31 again, so this seems to be run space one. And four other run spaces with uh, thread IDs from 30 to 51. And we see the same threads exiting after five seconds of sleep in our script. So what that means is that we can use a run space pool for concurrency. We can use it um, and we should use it because it's much more easier to use a run space pool to do concurrency and we don't have uh, the cleanup and the garbage collection that our run space pool automatically does for us. So we have a lot of um, benefits here. One last thing that I want to highlight uh, before putting this all together is how this behaves in the context of timers. And therefore we will create a new timer object. So a new object timers.timer. It's basically the same that we did in our um, in our start PL logging. And we will give it some properties. So the interval of 1000 milliseconds again, it should be enabled and it should not auto reset because auto reset basically means that it runs forever after we started it. So if we define an interval of 1000 milliseconds and set auto reset to true, which is the default, which is why we don't have to explicitly state it, um, it just runs and the elapsed event occurs every 1000 seconds, uh, milliseconds or every time the interval has uh, run out of time. So um, yeah, after that we will re register the object event with uh, the timer, with the property of elapsed and with the action of thread information script, so our thread information script. And when we execute this, the uh, thread information script will be executed one time. So we will uh, checking our we will be checking our document again here. Let's take a look at how this actually looks. So execute this. So we'll just uh, watch our uh, thread info file again. I've just cleaned it up. Then we have to make our uh, thread information script available to our PowerShell again. So thread information script execute and then we will start our timer object. So what this does, it executes uh, once and now the trigger was, um, so the elapsed event occurred once after 1000 milliseconds, it did not auto reset so it doesn't start a second time. It executed our script and we see inside of our script we now have access to our run space ID which is great. Um, which also um, means or which also shows us that we are running in run space ID 1. They are great for um, background threads and worker threads where we need to trigger or write uh, content to files or so some, some uh, things that need to be done in a specific interval and yeah that's what they are great for. This file uh, will also be available in um, the GitHub repository and in the session materials. So just um, download it, take a look at it and execute to understand run spaces and their context better for you. So the next thing we do is to put this all together and to write a asynchronous logging script. So now that we have all the basics, um, we can actually start write our logging class. Let's first discuss what we expect from our logging module. So I needed a logging module that uh, reflects the behavior of syslog. So it basically mirrors the um, behavior of a syslog um, log client, which means that we need to provide some kind of syslog compatible log output. So I first looked up what uh, syslog exactly looks like and created a little log message function. It basically creates a, a priority number. Uh, I don't know what it's called exactly, but it's the first value and it's calculated by um, facility multiplied with eight 
plus the syslog severity um, number. And the syslog severity number, I've created two enums to have all the options that exist. So the syslog facility and the syslog severity in my PowerShell class here. And before we go into the code, let's just see what this should look like. So we create a new logger instance um, of our PS logger and let's just see what's in there. So we just have logger instance and we obviously have some uh, hidden uh, class properties but nothing that's visible. So let's just do a get member on it and we see, oh, we have methods for every severity, for every syslog severity, so like alert, critical, emergency, informational and so on. And what we can do with these is to, yeah, actually lock messages into our log. And we need something to log to. So this is where our concurrency comes into place, right? So the first thing we need to know is where does our logger currently logs to? So therefore I've created a log location method and it shows us the current log directory and the current log file. And we could change that by using the set log location with a path that is then checked and written to these files. So but now we have the name of our log file. We will just copy it and we will watch that file like we did before. So we will do again content of this file and we will do wait and we will do force. So there's nothing in it right now. So let's uh, let's add an entry. Let's add an alert. This is an alert. And there it is. So our our log has a new entry, which looks like uh, it's actually compatible with syslog. So we have one line with uh, the different tags, with the date formatted correctly, with our DNS name, the process, process ID, the fields we cannot fill out, and our log message. So how does it look like if I use something like uh, critical, for example? Okay, sorry. So uh, this is critical. So critical. No, we need to write critical in caps lock. So this is critical. And uh, now we have a new line here. Uh, we see it's the same process ID. It's the same uh, everything except the um, priority number that has been recalculated. So if we just go with, with uh, informational, for example, informational, we have an informational entry which also says this is critical, but we know it's just informational because we know how syslog works and that this is a different ID. So, um, yeah, let's dive into it and let's see what we have actually done here. So, I already mentioned we have a few enums here. So, um, enums are the same enum construct that you have in, in every other .NET language, basically. So, you have an have a list of items and you can optionally set um, specific um, numbers for them. So to iterate through this enum, for example. And we can access every uh, number as well as every item and get the other part of the key value store. So um, what this enum helps us with is to hold our syslog facilities and severities, but also to hold our log options. This is not actually implemented with Azure Blob, Azure Append Blob and local logging. Currently, that's why it is set to local. So let's take a look at the PS logger class itself. The first thing we will notice is all of these class properties. So the first class property is the one we already know from our previous example. So this is our logging script. So we actually start PL logging um, with logging local. And the only difference here is that our logging method looks a little bit different because first of all, this is just logic to check if the log path changed. 
and the interesting part is actually the stream writer. So this is w, uh, this is dollar sw. So it stands for stream writer, and it's the object that get returned when uh, we invoke a pen text on our log file. Our log file is an actual item, so it's not like a string, but it's an object. And on initial load, we create this log file with the file name and the log location that will be defined later on. And after that, it gets created, it then checks if it's still the same or if we have changed it and changes the um, path of it, but we can ignore this. So the first thing that, gets, uh, that is interesting is the stream writer that we get and then we do a while and we check our log entries. And log entries is very interesting because log entries is actually a concurrent queue. So for log entries to um, is our um, item that we use to communicate to our logging run space. And let's take a look at that later because we don't know anything about our logging run space now, right now. And the only thing that we have to know is this is a queue. And the queue, so this while loop um, just iterates over the queue and tries to dequeue items until the queue is empty. So this process runs every second. And because it's a concurrent queue, we won't uh, run into locks because the queue um, does the locking by itself and we don't have to rely on um, creating our own locks or yeah, do anything like that. So this logging function here then flushes the stream writer and close it to dispose everything properly. And this is basically everything that is to our logging script because, like I said, it only initiates the log file based on the file name and log location and then starts PL logging. We all already know all this. Um, the more interesting parts come with the other class properties here. So we have our logging run space and uh, that's just a new run space from our uh, run space factory. So we are not using a run space pool, we are using a single run space because we want to have a single run space for logging um, our PowerShell entries to disk or to wherever we want to log it. Then we have our log entries. So this is a concurrent queue. We have the system.collections.concurrent namespace, which holds all the thread safe objects from .NET. So I recommend to always uh, use these when you handle uh, multi-threaded uh, properties and multi-threaded uh, variables or programs in general because otherwise you um, would have to implement this uh, yourself with a system uh, with a system threading monitor for example so with enter and exit um, if you want to use a hash table for example but there's also a concurrent uh, a synchronized hash table with which is a concurrent object and thereby is uh, thread safe so take a look at the concurrent collection and see if there are any items in there that you can use also, um, like always, my recommendation is to use as many native objects as possible. For example, um, hash table versus uh, .NET lists. Um, lists are superior in like every case. So try to stick to um, native .NET objects because you have much more control and much more visibility to know um, what actually happens and also in case of an error or a problem it's much more easier from my perspective to debug things like this if you use the native .NET objects because the error messages will also often be much more verbose. So what else do we have? We have the current process ID. It's the process ID just from the PID variable. We have a process name that is not defined now. Uh, we have a log location, which is just our path. We have FQDN, host name, file name, and we have our syslog facility, which is local 7, which is basically, basically the uh, default uh, if you're just doing standard syslog logging. So, yeah. So let's take a look at the 
constructor. So what are we doing in, in the constructor here? So the first name would be to set the host name. So the host name has no value right now, so we have to set the host name. We have to set the uh, the um, fqdn so we do this by getting our suffix by querying the dns suffix from our network card and by combining it with our host name so the fqdn gets written here so we again use the ternary operator here i love it <laughs> and um, we just um, see if suffix is empty or not and if suffix is empty uh, we just return the host name. If suffix is not empty, we return the uh, host name dot suffix. So yeah, very basic logic here. And the last part is to generate the file name of our uh, host file. So I choose to go with a um, pattern with a pattern that I use very often. So I just use the host name and use a yeah, like standardized um, date format here. Um, you will you will just see how it looks. It's basically where's the file? It's basically this. So we have uh, the host name underscore our uh, timestamp dot log. So let's stop this because we don't need this currently. And for our script properties, um, I used a little trick because as we've seen before, um, if you just want to create some getters and some setters, um, it's, yeah, it's a very tedious work. So I don't want to create like uh, 10, 20 setters and getters here just for our syslog severity. So as you've seen in the example, the target is to have our logger and then have a class method um, with the same name as our syslog severity that writes a message to the log. So we need to create a class method for every syslog facility. So that means a uh, severity, sorry, for every syslog severity. We don't want to do this on our own because it's very unflexible and we also can, for example, add some more um, items to this enum and then we would have to update it here and we will also have a lot of duplicated code. And I always try to avoid duplicated code because, yeah, it's best practice. And so I created a little function called add severities. Um, add severities is right here. So we just create a new property of the uh, type ps script method with our property name which is severity because we loop over our enum here and so this is the severity and after that it's actually a script block that refers to the content of our script method so what should the script method uh, look like and you will notice that this uh, get new closure we have to execute it to get the uh, right variables from the parent uh, scope and from the parent context into our variable here. So because what we want to do is to create a general method that um, writes or that calls the underscore log message method with the value that we provide. So it's this value from the parent block. So that is, for example, this is an alert here and we want to give it the prop name. The prop name is the severity. And so what we provide to the log message is, uh, method is our log message and which severity type it is. So alert, informational, and so on. And uh, to be able to reference these correctly, we have to do um, this basically. So we have one of these is the prop name from here and one of these is the prop name we give into our log message function and to get this result correctly we need to get a new closure so after that we just add our just created ps script method to our object so this dot ps object doesn't dot methods dot add remember this is always the current class instance and after this we have all the severities created so when we do a get member again on our logger object, we see that 
here are some script methods called alert, critical, debug, emergency and so on. The next thing is just to start the logging and this is where things get interesting. So when we start logging, what we actually do is we create uh, our logging run space. So you've already seen that we created our new run space from our run space factory in our logging run space. So we will use this variable to create our logging run space. You see here we set a few options. So we want to reuse the thread and then we open our run space. Then we make use of the session state proxy. So I always said it's very important for you to use um, synchronized or thread safe variables. Thread safe variables are important because um, different run spaces can share a state. And that's what this session state proxy is for. So we just define all the variables from our current scope that should be available to our logging run space. And remember, our logging run space is the one that should execute our script, so our logging script. So the variables that we need to be available there are log entries, because log entries is our concurrent queue that holds all our log entries. And we need to write into our concurrent queue from this thread and have the other thread to check um, once a second if there are any new log entries and to dequeue all of them. The second thing that we need is our log location and our file name um, to basically create the log file and write to it. And then we need our host name um, for some log output and to create the file and uh, yeah. So after we added all these variables to our session state proxy with this uh, syntax, so log entries and this dot log entries basically means that there's a variable called log entries available to the login run space and that is basically a reference to this dot underscore log entries which will also be added to the session state proxy so this is the same variable and this will be mapped to this variable inside of our login run space and we can see this because we have already taken a look at our logging function here so our logging function uses them. We have log file and we see that log file is not defined anywhere in this context, in this function, in this scope. It's actually a variable that comes from our session state proxy. And that's the same with file name and log location. So this is very important to know because otherwise you would wonder where these variables come from. And also there's no underscore in front of it because we can give this any name we want. We can also call this completely different like a logging run space entry object or something like that and it will still work the same. And yeah, so after we added all our variables to the session state proxy, we do the same that we did before in our uh, earlier example. So we add the script to our PowerShell run space and we have our run space in CMD um, just uh, for readability and then we do begin invoke. So we have a new PowerShell object here. We define the run space on our PowerShell object and we call begin invoke on our PowerShell object. And that's everything that happens when we create a new instance of our logger class because that is what start logging does. And that means that after we created a new instance of our logger, so basically exactly this so logger is equal to ps logger new. And now everything that we just looked at will be executed. So the severities will be generated, the new timer will be um, executed, and we have all of that available. So Let's just execute it and see that we have all our um, script methods available here. And we also see that we have no timers in our current context because the timer object was created in a new run space. So this is why we don't see any event subscribers here. And uh, yeah, so just if you, in case you wonder, 
if there are any event subscribers available. So let's let's see what we can do with our logger and uh, just see because it obviously has uh, gotten a new log location. So the current log location is a new log file and we will just get the content of it and wait for new content. So let's see what happens if we execute a logging entry and there it is. So we see our timer that is the only object that is able to write to the file currently was triggered even though we cannot see any event subscriber event here. We cannot see any event subscriber event here that is uh, related to our object but it runs in the background and we have it available for all this uh, logging functionality that we have. And the, the beautiful thing about this and why I initially choose to do that is because it's very easy to um, integrate this class into your own module because now we have a PS logger we can just create um, a PS logger object here like I showed before and we can just lock um, entries and it's not blocking because it's uh, the entry is locked to a concurrent um, queue and the queue is just uh, worked over and over um, every second by a complete different run space or so complete different threads so we don't have any blocking things going on here and as long as our PowerShell script runs if it's a GUI if it's uh, yeah whatever you can just uh, use it to lock your uh, data to some place on the disk and the second um, thing or the second reason why I choose to do this in classes is because you can just expand this and import this as a class in all your uh, scripts and then independently develop your uh, class so for example now we have the log message with the hard-coded um, syslog format if we want this in another format, we can either add a switch here, we can give it a um, parameter where it should uh, switch based on, or we can even provide a pattern itself by itself. So for example, uh, yeah, just provide this and some values or think, um, think of some uh, basic construct, some, or we can just provide a pattern by ourselves. So just uh, think of some templating you just provide something like this and um, then you get the output that you want with the available parameters inside of your login class and the third very nice thing that um, i also use a lot is to expand this logging script here to not only be able to write to disk or something but to be able to write to other locations and this that's why I've created this log options here. So the uh, log options um, that I use most often are actually Azure Append Blobs. So Azure Append Blobs are just log files, but um, blob um, objects that you can only append to. They are especially good for logs. That's what they were made for. And it's really easy to write into Append Blobs, basically. So that's... Uh, that's a very good opportunity here to write to other systems. You can just do like REST calls or yeah, do whatever you want. But the very, but the thing that you should take away from this is that it's extremely modular and that you can recycle all your code very easily and import it very easily. If you put this into a class file, if you use the class file to import your logging script and then or any other type of script and then just do all the changes in your checked and logging file and just import them later on in, in your code. I hope you've learned something today and have now a better understanding of multi-threading in PowerShell and also how you can use existing concepts like PowerShell classes and PowerShell run spaces and combine them for a better experience and to tackle some problems that you may stumble upon in your daily work. So let's get to the summary. So the first point that I want to um, 
highlight is that you should use run spaces for simple multi-threading if you want to use it inside of your modules or scripts and want the most uh, comprehensive and advanced functionalities to synchronize between multiple run spaces, synchronize variables, synchronize properties and so on. And I wrote simple multi-threading because as soon as you go into more um, parallel things and more multi-threading and with a lot of uh, complexity in it, I would recommend to use a run space factory because it abstracts some of the more complex management tasks for run spaces that you would otherwise have to implement yourself and um, it gives you a little bit more control over the parallelism and how threads are actually um, acquired uh, from the system and things like that. So the next thing would be to use thread safe objects or to implement thread safety yourself. So that's very important because um, if you don't use thread safe objects you will run into race conditions and you really don't want to do that. And also it's not that hard to actually create a thread uh, safe object or to create a a lock for an object and making it kind of thread safe. Otherwise there are still a lot of thread safe objects. There's a dedicated namespace for that from Microsoft.net. Um, so you can just look up all thread safe objects in the concurrency namespace and just choose from the objects that are there um, which one fits your use case best. If you're working with UIs, one of the experience that I had was that the user experience is massively better if you use a UI in worker thread. This is something that is pretty obviously from a classical programming standpoint, but at PowerShell um, people often use WPF or uh, use Windows Forms and something like that and use the same thread that they use to instantiate their UI to also do the work and this means you have a blocking thread and you block your UI as soon as you do some work. So as soon as you click a button and some work starts in the background it will block your UI. So create your UI in a separate thread, create your um, work in a separate thread, make them communicate with uh, thread safe objects and just send the information between UI and worker thread just give something like loading indicators or things like that so that the user knows that the application has not crashed and also um, that tasks can actually run in the background. And the last very important thing I want to highlight is that you need to dispose most of the objects so always be careful double check if your uh, objects get disposed automatically and get, get uh, garbage collected and if not dispose them. So this provides a lot of junk um, in your system and in your system memory so just be sure that all the objects that you use are finally disposed. For slides, materials and the demo code just visit the uh, GitHub repository of PowerShell Conference EU 2020 and I think uh, when you watch this video all of the slides and the demo code should be available there. Um, also take a look at the uh, references that I listed in my presentation and um, take a look at the example repository that I already mentioned about the PowerShell classes examples. If you would like to get in contact, just send me a Twitter message, uh, read our blog at itsinsights.org for more information, take a, take a look at the mentioned uh, GitHub repositories and yeah, just write me in any social media or business network where you can find me if you have any more questions or would just like to get in contact. I hope we meet in person next year. So. See you at the PowerShell Conference Europe 2021 in Hanover from the 1st to the 4th of June and stay healthy and have a nice rest of the conference. Enjoy!